somehow we've got to die to this. I'm sorry. You will never talk yourself out of them. Because if you're creative, you can think a lot more red stuff than just what we got on the newsprint. You could come up with 7 or 11 other types of things like that. We've got to die to that. And the word that you find in the scriptures is repent. And that word is found everywhere. The problem with repent is it's one of those words that we hear all the time and we think we know what it means, but we may not know what it means. And so I, I, there's an analogy my dad, who used to be in the ministry, used to give, and I liked it, and, and it made sort of sense to me, and, and so I'm going to give it to you for what it is worth. But repentance would be something along these lines. Say that Matt Kessler and I are getting ready to go on a two-day conference that's going on just over here in Memphis. And we're kind of excited about this. We're taking off a few days. We want to get away, no offense, kick back, have some fun, hear some learn teaching, whatever, but to go to a couple of nice restaurants and play a little bit. And I've been told that if you get on I-40 East, you could be there in a couple of hours. And so Matt and I flip a coin, who's going to drive? I lose the, the flip, so okay, I'll drive. And so I swing by early in the morning, 6 a.m., ask Matt to come on out. He's running out here. He, we go by at McDonald's, get some coffee, get some uh, whatever you eat for breakfast at McDonald's, and we're, we're turning up some music, rocking and rolling, found I-40, and headed out, and we'll be there in two hours. But just before, uh, nearly two hours has gone by, and we're chewing the fat and having a hoot, and we start coming up on signs that say Fort Smith, Oklahoma, 20 miles, and we go, what is going on? And, I, and we begin to say, oh, my gosh, what do we do? Now, I could feel bad and tell Matt that I feel bad. It was my responsibility to look the right direction on I-40, and instead of going I-40 east to get to Memphis, no offense, I kind of got I-40, but then I was going in the wrong direction. And I could tell him I felt bad, but that's not repentance. And I could say, Matt, in fact, I'm sorry. I am sorry that I've messed this thing up, and we got to... Stop this kind of thing. It's horrible. And that's wonderful, but that's not repentance. I could even tell him I have a burden of guilt that I'm experiencing right now as we zing on down toward Fort Smith, Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma. And so the reality is that Matt would say to me at some point, I think, Chuck, it's wonderful you feel sorry. It's wonderful you feel guilty. It's wonderful that you feel a burden of, of, but if you don't take the next exit and get off and go up over the ramp and head back the other direction, we will never get to Memphis. That is repentance. And that means that you've got to die to whatever you're doing that's not helpful and go in another direction altogether. And when we begin to do that, we begin to see a major theological point of God's call in our lives in the Scripture and in human history. God's call in our lives with reference to repentance is everywhere. And you're going to see it graphically in the prophets of the Old Testament again and again. It's a dominant theme of Scripture. I need you guys to repent. Not tell me how horrible you feel about yourself. Not tell me how guilty you feel. Not tell me what a slug bucket you are. All that kind of stuff. I don't want to know that. What I want you to do is repent. Go in a different direction. This, or you get to the John the Baptist, burst on the scene. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Hey, I, not you need to be a slug bucket. I need you to repent. Jesus started his ministry with repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so you see, and then at the end, and of course, again, throughout the Gospels, Jesus is talking about that. When he went and talked to Levi and he ate with all the Pharisees and people objected that he's sitting around, not Pharisees, but the tax collectors and, and people like that, the people objected to that. And he said, wait a minute, so the Son of Man came to call not the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And so you start seeing this kind of concept and you start going, wow, that's what I need. That's what would make something change. And at the end of Luke's version of the Great Commission, he actually says, go out into all the world, teaching them to repent, calling them to repent. So the thought you have again and again and again is we've got to move in another direction. And it's not the direction that we've been heading on. 
The direction that he would have us move is the one that you see in the center uh, newsprint here. And someone nailed it a minute ago. Uh, what do you think your life would look like if you took this seriously and turned back this other way? You guys said, not me, you guys said, I guess I'd have a deeper relationship with God. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess I'd feel more freedom. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess I'd feel blessing. Somebody else said the same thing. I guess my life would be filled with joy. And, and, and I guess I would display the gospel in my life. I'd feel less fear. I'd feel less stress. I might have softened hearts, less fear, more peace. Basically, we call it, the, we think this is what it would look like. What Jesus called it was, and someone said this, he called it the abundant life. And what he said is, I want you to turn from the direction that you're moving and move toward a life that I want for you. And the life that I want for you is what I would call the abundant life, John 10.10 10 type of thing. And it will put a smile on your face. And you will be able to experience what the Father wants for you anyway. He is not constantly trying to slap the smile off your face. He actually wants you to be happy. He invented the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all this type of stuff. You have. He, that's what He wants for you. But if we stay over in this world, I'm sorry, it's not a happy experience. And it ain't love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness. And so you end up saying, well, I don't know if I can take the leap. That's like a leap of faith. Bingo. <laughs> I, I, that's, that'd be like, wow, I'm not sure I've resolved all my problem issues. Bingo. I would just have to, like Abraham, I'd like to just head out. And Jesus basically says, that's what I want for you. And he will use all types of things to help us get there. He, Jesus, his own ministry. He, and he'd use material stuff to, to wine and dine you. I mean, he just would. If you look at the first miracle of Canaan and Galilee, what's he do? He turns water into wine. It's a very material kind of thing. But if you read that passage, it ends with the statement, and they believed in him. So he's, he's already on our side. Oh, yeah, he wants me to have wine? Tell me more. Yeah, I can do that kind of stuff. Or, or if you look at Luke 5, and, and he's out there calling Peter, James, and John, and they've been fishing all night. They haven't caught anything. And, you know, that's a big deal. If you're a fisherman, that kind of matters. Like if you're a stockbroker, you keep guessing wrong. That kind of matters, and people get surly with you. But if you're a fisherman, you need kind of whatever you need. And what if somebody, Jesus says, why don't you throw the nets on the other side and, and see what happens? Well, Lord, I've been fishing all night, but if you say so, I'll do it. So he lets down the nets again. And remember, he caught that huge number of fish and almost had to, had to bring in the Zebedee boys, James and John, to help him load them all in. It was incredible. And so in that thing, and that passage ends with, and they dropped everything and followed him. What he's trying to get us to do is to move away from my fear I have a bad catch, didn't get anything all night. I don't think I have enough. We ran out of wine. It's a horrible thing. I can't even believe it. about to make me break down and cry. And he wants us to come over this way and say, you think your life would look like that? And I'm calling it the abundant life, and I came to give you life, and that more abundant. Not I came to take your life and slap that silly smile off that face. I want you to experience the fruits of the Spirit. I want you to experience a deeper relationship with me. I want you to know the promises which are over here. And the, the answer to this is, I need you to turn and come this way. Don't keep heading to Fort Smith if you're trying to get to Memphis. I had this nervousness that if you do that, you'll end up eventually in California, and then you'll end up in the water, and it just kind of gets worse and worse, even as you eat, drink your coffee and, and eat your sausage biscuits. It's going to be bad until we turn around and go in another direction. So theologically, when you look at stewardship, like every other subject, what you're really looking at, it's a call. Let's go. And because where your treasure is there, where your heart be, it goes to the heart. It's about as important as most things. That's why he spends a third of his parables and a sixth of recorded words talking about it because he knows it's so important. But I can't get you where you need to be unless you'll begin to follow and come this way. So in session one, I told you about the Zacchaeus story and come on down. You can stay in the tree if you want to, but that's not going to put a smile on your face. 
Uh, and when you're talking about the disciples, drop your nets and follow me. And you can keep doing the fish thing if you want to, but it's not going to give you the kind of life that you wanted. And all of the work that we do in mission and evangelism, in building the church and being the witnesses is to invite people that are huddled and scared and anxious, just like in the Sermon on the Mount, when they were anxious about what to wear, what to eat, what to do. They anxious all the time into another kind of life, and it does, and I cannot apologize for it, it does involve providence. God thinks he can take care of you. So what I would want you to do if, this, if you were interacting into the second biblical thing is I would want you to take that same sheet which I'm computing a pledge that I gave you in session one, do that work and find how you could begin to move in another direction, out of the tree into another direction. I can tell you in my experience with tithing for 35 years that it's true. Now, I could have told you I think it's true 35 years ago. But 35 years later, I can actually look back and say it's just kind of crazy and amazing because I'm okay. I don't have kind of run over shoes and slop bucket clothes and holes in my, they'll know we are Christians by the holes in our suits. They will, you know, it's, I've actually found that it's, it's, my life is rich and good. And, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I have everything I could ever think up, but I'm saying for 35 years, he actually thinks he can take care of me, and he has. That's all I'm telling you. And, and, and so I would want any disciple of Jesus Christ to move forward in every area of their lives, but also in the area of stewardship because it goes so to the heart of where our anxiety is, where our fears are, where our absence of the fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, uh, generosity, all those types of things, and let the Spirit operate on a deeper level. I said last night when we were together that there are the fruit, there is a gift of the Spirit, which is giving and generosity, and it is an, a, a gift of the Holy Spirit. And that does produce marvelous things. And I would love for you to experience in your own life, in your own witness, and I can tell you from my experience, the promise is valid. Now, if you took this material home and you sleep on it and you think it through, my challenge to you is not to just keep living over here, but make the move. Take the repentance thing, which is the dominant theme of Scripture. It's the dominant theme of church history. The Great Awakening and all the subsequent Great Awakenings are always about repentance. I need you to turn over here where the food table is, the banquet table. I need you to come over this way where the stuff you want, and i like you to have it anyway, is. I want you to come over here. And that's the charge and the challenge for all of us as Christians. And we need to learn it in this life and begin to experience the joy of Jesus actually taking care of us, providence. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for all that you promise in Scripture. It overwhelms, quite frankly. And we ask your forgiveness for our reluctance to fully believe it and risk. We pray that you'll give us a spirit of boldness that we might actually turn and move and move further into the life that you've promised us and that you want for us, the abundant life. And grant us to lay aside all the anxieties that trap us, die to those things that are hurtful to us, and begin to live more and more to the life you came to give and to bear witness to that with all with whom we come in contact, that the good news of the gospel might be manifest in our lives and the witness might be an encouragement to others and that your church may grow in strength and in effectiveness in a fallen and broken world. And we pray that with expectation because we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.